If I put a co-living house in my neighborhood, the cars are gonna be parked everywhere. Is that really true? Guys, I wanna talk really quickly about parking because a lot of times I'll get these comments where people will say, well, man, if you're gonna have 10 people sharing a home or even eight people sharing a home, like that's crazy. You must have cars everywhere <laughs> spilling out into the street. The neighborhood hates you and this is terrible for the neighborhood. You know, guys, I, I wanna just share two things really fast. First, I wanna address the part about the neighborhood hating you. You know, I, I've been in this business of renting co-living shared housing homes for a very, very long time now, almost a decade and a half. And I've also had a bunch of Airbnbs. And you know, when Airbnb first came out, everybody thought, oh, no way Airbnb will work. But then obviously it took off in this huge, huge, huge way. And now what we have is we have Airbnbs all over the place and I have Airbnbs and Airbnbs lend themselves towards parties, right? Because think about it. If you're going to go out with 15 guys and throw a bachelor party. You're not going to go rent 15 hotel rooms or seven hotel rooms. You're going to go rent a big Airbnb. It's going to be cheaper and you're going to have a better experience. You know, I have this one Airbnb on Lake Norman here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'll be honest, guys, I get calls almost weekly from the neighbors complaining. It's too loud. People are throwing a party. It's that one time we had a 400 person party. But I can honestly say to you that in a decade and a half of doing co-living, I get called on the Airbnb every week, but in a decade and a half of doing co-living, I get called, I've gotten called maybe three times in total with hundreds and hundreds of roommates and tenants and members, we call them now. I want you to understand that these are not party houses and they don't lend themselves to party houses because if you vet your tenants correctly, you're providing a co-living space for what? Working professionals who have jobs, who have to get up in the morning, who have to go. Yeah, sure, they might drink a little bit on the weekend or smoke something on the weekend, but like most of the time, they are working. Also, in our house rules and something that you need to do when you do co living is we limit the number of overnight guests to a maximum of five. And here's the thing if someone brings over 15 guests, and wants to throw a party, usually in a house that large, if you have eight people sharing it, one person's not gonna want that party. They're gonna call the landlord or the management and say, hey, they're throwing a party, I'm trying to get some sleep. And that's gonna shut that party down real, 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 real fast. So I want you to understand that if we wanna compare them, Airbnb can be way worse for the neighborhood. This is actually providing housing people who are working there, right? And everybody's working in different shifts, so the cars are not all parked there at the same time. They just aren't. But you do have to think through parking. Now we found that for our tenant base, our member base, about 50 to 70% of them are gonna have cars. That means if I have 10 people sharing the house, I need parking at any one time for five to seven people. But it's actually ended up being less than that because what happens is someone working first shift, someone's working second shift, someone's working third shift. And so they're all kind of like out doing different things. And sometimes there might be one car there, two cars there. However, even with that being said, I do recommend that when you create a co-living house, you create a parking plan. It could be adding a little concrete pad to the right. It could be adding a little concrete pad to the left. Creating a parking plan could be very simply making sure there's enough street parking. It could be drawing out on a piece of paper like I've got here. Hey, room one's gonna park here, room two's gonna park here, room three's gonna park here, and then this and this and this. It could be that, okay? It's really, really, really important that you create that parking plan. In summary, you don't need as many parking spots as you might think, but you should think through parking for your co-living home. There are things that are way worse for neighborhoods than co-living, and co-living's actually out there solving a problem. It's creating more workforce housing, more affordable housing, and at the same time, you're not destroying the neighborhood. You probably would be destroying it more if you put an Airbnb in that neighborhood, right? One of the questions we'll always ask is, does this actually fit the neighborhood though? Is it in vibe with the neighborhood? If it's a super crisp, clean neighborhood, then maybe it's not the best neighborhood to put a co-living home in. And you have to think about that. As long as you think that through, you're going to be fine. And people that are actually living in a house, they also want to be on good terms with the neighbors. They don't want to be on bad terms. So they're going to really, really, really try to be respectful. And if you vet your tenants correctly, you're getting respectful people in there anyway. Hopefully this was helpful in inspiring you to take your next step towards co-living. I hope that next step is joining us on our five-day challenge, which is a free event where we'll kind of deep dive into how you can achieve financial freedom through this model called co-living. Check out the link in the description and I'll see you guys on the other side. Here's to your success.